All right, welcome back. Chapter 10, part one, part one is airway management, artificial ventilation, and oxygenation. This is a rather long chapter, so we may have to break it up into two uh, videos. Maybe not. Overview is going to be respiration, respiratory system review. Airway assessment, assessment of breathing, assessment, assessing for adequate breathing, and deciding whether or not to assist ventilation. Techniques of artificial ventilation. Special considerations in airway management and ventilation and oxygen therapy, and, and then we have our summary. All right, here's your case study. First case study, EMTs Chris Frost and Brittany Sullivan arrive on the scene of a call for a sick person. Unknown problem where they immediately see a man in his 40s lying on his right side on the floor. There is a makeshift tourniquet beneath the man's arm and a hypodermic syringe and needle lying next to him. <clears throat> the patient is pale with cyanosis of his lips. He has very shallow, slow breathing, and he has vomited. What threats to the patient's life are apparent so far? What do Chris and Brittany need to do uh, to intervene in the life threats? And what equipment will the EMTs need to carry out those interventions? Remember, you can pause this video and write these questions down so you can go back and answer them as we go along. Introduction. An open airway, adequate ventilation, and sufficient oxygenation are necessary to sustain life. These components are part of the primary assessment that is conducted on every patient. Respiration is the gas exchange that occurs between the alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries and between the body's cells and adjacent capillaries. Four components of respiration are pulmonary ventilation, external respiration, internal respiration, and cellular respiration. A review of the anatomy of the respiratory system. Uh, we're going to talk about the upper airway. The upper airway extends from nose and mouth to the cricoid cartilage. In unresp unresponsive patients, the tongue can be obst can obstruct the upper airway, the epiglot and the epiglottis may not close. In altered mental status, relaxation of muscles can cause the epiglottis to obstruct the larynx. Here's a review of your uh, upper airway. This is something you need to look over uh, as you study for the next exam. And here's a review and picture of the larynx. Figure A on the left is the interior view. And B is the posterior view, the front and the back. Something you need to look over in your textbook and your PowerPoint slides, just like I'm going through right now, when you study for the test. The lower airway extends from the cricoid cartilage to alveoli. Here's another review of the lower airway. So from the cricoid cartilage, which is what you see. Let's see if it doesn't show you the cricoid here, but um, it's going to be up here. So you're, everything, excuse me, it's, it's right here. This cricoid cartilage is right here. So your trachea begins here and goes down. They took a cutaway of, the tra of what the trachea looks like on the inside. Review this so that you can, when you uh, take the test, you can... Uh, Know this information for the next test. Okay, click to indicate which process below involves the exchange of gases between the capillaries and the tissue cells of the body. And if you chose internal respiration, you'd be correct. Internal respiration is the process of oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange between the blood in the systemic capillaries and the cells. All right, mechanics of ventilation, how it works. Inhalation is an active process. External intercostal muscles and diaphragm con uh, contract. Chest cavity increases in size. Pressure in the chest cavity decreases. Air is drawn through the nose and mouth. Exhalation, when we breathe out, is a passive process. External intercostal muscles and diaphragm relax. Chest cavity decreases in size. Pressure in the chest cavity increases. Air is forced out through the nose and mouth. Okay, on the left you see inhalation. On the right you see exhalation. So you need to review this, see how it works. And those negative, there's negative signs here and positive signs here. That means there's negative pressure in the chest cavity when we inhale. And then there's positive pressure. Those arrows are putting, you see that 
the intercostal muscles and everything are putting in diaphragm are putting pressure, positive pressure on the airway, on the, excuse me, the chest cavity. All right. Make sure you review these images uh, for the upcoming test. Control of respiration. Respiratory centers in the brainstem receive input from chemoreceptors about the level of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and pH. The primary stimulus to breathe is increased carbon dioxide in arterial blood. So when our body, when those chemoreceptors uh, get a signal of too much carbon dioxide, that's when it tells our body we need to breathe in so that we can inhale some oxygen. Some COPD patients rely on a hypoxic drive. A hypoxic drive is hypo, meaning low, oxic, meaning uh, of the of oxygen, uh, low oxygen. Um, COPD patients have it having a COPD stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or disorder, and it'll let them know that hey that there's too much uh, carbon dioxide, that hypoxic drive will let them know there's too much carbon dioxide and it will cause them to breathe. And uh, sometimes it'll, it'll get so low and then their hypoxic drive doesn't work and then they, they will go into almost uh, an asthma attack, so, so to speak. Respiratory physiology, uh, oxygenation is the process in which oxygen saturates the blood in the cells. Ventilation is the mechanical process of moving air in and out of the lungs. Respiration is the process of gas exchange. Hypoxemia is a low oxygen content in arterial blood that may occur from inadequate ventilation of alveoli despite adequate lung perfusion, inadequate lung perfusion despite adequate ventilation, combination of poor ventilation and perfusion. Now, that word hypoxia, hypox, excuse me, hypoxemia in this uh, bullet here, hypo, Always rhymes with low. OX meaning oxygen. EMEA meaning uh, condition of the blood. Low oxygen in the blood. As we can see is low oxygen content in arterial blood. So you'll hear me say things like hypoxemia, hypoxia, things like that. So you need to understand these medical terms. Hypoxia means that inadequate oxygen is being delivered to the cells. Low oxygen in the cells. It could be uh, from an airway obstruction, uh, inadequate breathing, and shock. Anything that's uh, hindering the oxygen um, being transferred to the cells from the capillary beds. Which oxygen starts when it comes into our airway, our upper airway, down to our lower airway in the alveoli and exchanges um, in the alveoli in the capillary beds. And that's where we get pick up our oxygenated blood and our oxygenated blood goes back to the heart where it is pumped to the body so it can be delivered to the cells. That is perfusion. It's critical that you recognize signs of mild and severe hypoxia. So here's one. A, we see the con conjunctiva. Uh, we pull down the patient's eye. We look on in there. That little, it should be red. Uh, it'll be bluish purple. Um, B, the mucosa uh, lining. So when you open their mouth, look in, look in their gums and their lips, and you'll see a bluish purple. Um, C, the fingernails, um, and D, uh, the circumural area or area around the uh, lips. Um, it's probably going to be more severe cases here in figure D, but uh, that'll give you signs that there is hypoxia going on. It's called cyanosis. So it, you will hear me say the word cyanosis several times. Signs of severe hypoxia in infants and children, hypoxia may result in bradycardia instead of tachycardia. Bradycardia is low. Bradycardia, or slow, excuse me. Brady is slow, so bradycardia, slow heart rate. Okay, because cardia deals with the heart. Bradycardia means slow. And, excuse me, tachy, and where tachycardia, if we look at tachy, tachy is fast. Brady is slow, tachycardia is uh, fast heart rate. Alveolar capillary exchange, which is external re uh, respiration. Gases move from areas of higher concentration to areas of lower concentration. Carbon dioxide diffuses from the capillaries into the alveoli. Oxygen diffuses from the alveoli into the blood and is bound to hemoglobin. Uh, you'll hear me say that a bunch. The, the oxygen is bound to 
hemoglobin in the blood. That is important when we start talking about carbon dioxide later on. Internal respiration. Blood enters the capillaries is high in oxygen. Blood entering the cap capillaries is high in oxygen, which diffuses into the cells. Remember, you need oxygen and glucose for aerobic cell meta cellular metabolism. Uh, that's going to produce the adenosine triphosphate or the ATP, which is energy. So if you don't have oxygen, you don't have pr um, proper cell metabolism. So that's why blood entering the capillaries is high in oxygen from the alveolar. Cells are high in carbon dioxide, which diffuse into the blood. So when we, when our hemoglobin, our blood, which has the, the oxygen attached to the hemoglobin, brings the oxygen-rich blood to the cells, it dumps it off in there, and the cell says, here, you can have this carbon dioxide, puts it in the blood. Now the blood is deoxygenated, and it brings it back to the heart and the lungs so it can be expelled through exhalation. And here we go. On the left, we see uh, gas exchange at the alveolar level. So um, oxygen comes in. It's picked up by the blood in the capillary bed. It, so it's going to go into this deoxygenated blood. But that deoxygenated blood is going to dump off that CO2, then pick up that oxygen. And then that oxygenated blood can take it down the venule, back to the heart to be pumped where it needs to go. And this is just a blown up picture of it right here. And on the right, we see the oxygenated blood and nutrients from the blood being dumped off into the cells here. And the CO2 in the waste, the cells say, nope, you can have that back. Uh, you can get rid of this. So it dumps it off into the blood to be uh, expelled through the body, through the filtration systems. All right, the pathophysiology of pulmonary ventilation and external and internal respiration. Disturbance in ventilation or respiration can lead to cellular hypoxia. Disturbance in ventilation, that means something's blocking the airway, something's causing your patient not to breathe. Anaerobic metabolism results, so remember anaerobic as the um, absence of oxygen in cellular metabolism. Anaerobic metabolism results in insufficient energy production a buildup of lactic acid, and cell dysfunction. Remember, if cell dies, you die. Pulmonary ventilation may be impaired by an interruption of nervous control, damage to the thorax, increased airway resistance, and loss of airway patency. Uh, and a patent airway means it is clear and free of any obstruction. So if there is a, an obstruction, uh, there's an injury to the airway and it causes the patency to be lost, then you will have um, an impaired pulmonary ventilation and low oxygen, uh, low oxygen levels eventually. Gas exchange may be impaired by decreased ambient oxygen content, lung disease, drowning, toxic gases. Toxic gases, uh, to understand that, is like, um, it will, t the gases will take place of the oxygen and, um, that's a bad thing because we don't, you know, some of those gases like carbon, carbon monoxide will bind to the hemoglobin like oxygen and there'll be no room for the oxygen to bind and, uh, it will give off a false oxygen saturation. And we'll talk about that a little later. All right. Obstructed forward movement of the blood. So um, if there's a arterial bleed or anything like that that's causing uh, hemorrhage or blood loss, then um, our gas exchange will definitely be impaired. Hypovolemia, hypo meaning low, volume, VOL means volume, emia, condition of the blood, low blood volume is what hypovolemia means. You will need to know that and remember that. If hypo, hypovolemia is taking place, then uh, that means we are losing blood somewhere. And we need to stop it so that we can have uh, get our gas exchange back to where it needs to be. All right, airway anatomy in infants and children. Uh, chest the chest wall is pliable. I mean, it's it's a little a little less sturdy than than what we're used to. Uh, increased reliance on the diaphragm, so the diaphragm is going to be working pretty hard. Uh, lungs are easily overinflated and in artificial ventilation. Uh, they're smaller 
uh, and we, we tend to get excited when we when we ventilate people. And if we ventilate too much or too fast, then we can overinflate them and cause them to rupture and pneumothoraxes and respiratory failure. And that's not good because the leading cause of cardiac arrest in infants and children is respiratory failure. Uh, comparison of airways of adult and uh, adult and infant or child. So you look on the left, you can see uh, different um, comparisons. If you look at the tongue, I know the tongue is bigger in adults, but the tongue is rather large in a child. So that is one uh, piece of anatomy that is going to be a problem. And this is why when if we do not suspect uh, a spinal injury in a uh, unresponsive child or infant, we need to do that head tilt chin lift really good, get it really uh, back there because um, that tongue can pose a huge problem um, for our airway patency because uh, it's not it's not offering a lot of room in their in their oral cavity um, for anything to happen. So um, I think this is why kids uh, talk funny when they're when they're little because their tongues are so big. Maybe maybe I'm wrong. I could possibly be wrong. I'm almost positive I'm wrong. All right, uh, airway anatomy in infants and children, limit, limited oxygen reserves, uh, high metabolic rate and oxygen needs. Uh, hypoxia is the most common cause of cardiac arrest. Well, I told you earlier, respiratory failure, which will stop the oxygen from coming in and which will cause uh, cardiac arrest. Anatomical features in infants and children that may uh, cause them to deteriorate more rapidly than adults. Okay, airway assessment is going to be one of, is probably the most, excuse me, the most important part of your patient assessment. If a patient cannot push air in and out, then really there's nothing else you can do for them. Other than if they're bleeding somewhere, external bleeding, um, then you could stop that, but then you got to get back to that airway because... Uh, airway, air moving in and out, oxygen exchange, gas exchange, and uh, the blood needs to stay in the blood vessels and not pump out of the body or into a dead space of the body. So those are the two most important things. Air and blood need to stay where they need to be and they need to function properly because if it doesn't, then we, we really are just wasting our time doing anything else. All right. The airway can be blocked by injuries such as burns or soft tissue trauma. Uh, the patient on the left, he looks alert. Um, he's got his, his little non-rebreather on, probably high flow oxygen, and it looks like he caught a burn to the face, maybe a gas burn. So um, you, he was 100% breathing when that happened, I'm sure. So he may have inhaled toxic gas or a really uh, high heat level. And it could have burned his inner airway or, or um, toxic gases could have blocked his inner airway causing burns or corrosion or something like that. The guy on the right, obviously um, uh, serious trauma there where it broke some teeth, probably his mandible. Um, you have airway compromise right here in the oral cavity, obviously because of bloody secretions, probably chunks of uh, his cheek or lip and, and maybe some teeth in there. Uh, the best thing you can do is suction all that stuff you can get out of there and try to get that airway patent. Um, I see a non-rebreather at the bottom, and uh, so I'm pretty sure they got this guy, like, uh, knocked out, I would imagine. But uh, C-collar's still on him, so, you know, there's real. I mean, you, you, you can't get it too caught up in trying to fix this other than you need to get that airway established. Uh, and once you get that airway established, then you just keep suctioning that stuff so he doesn't choke on it. And get them to the hospital as quick as you can because only surgery is going to fix that. All right, so uh, signs of an open airway. Air can be felt and heard moving in and out of the mouth and nose. So if you can feel it or hear it moving in and out of the mouth and the nose, because remember the nasopharynx and the oropharynx connect at the pharynx and then down to the larynx. So um, if we can get air moving in through the nose, then, then uh, I think that's a good thing. If we can't get it moving in through the mouth, we just have to make sure we don't need to suction the oral, oral pharynx. And the patient is speaking in full sentences or with little difficulty. Um, it's always a good sign. That means they're moving air in and out. The sound of the voice is normal for the patient. So if they're talking and, and the family member says, hey, that's not normal, if they're struggling to breathe, 
you know, if they sound hoarse or, or coarse or anything like that. Um, you hear audible wheezing coming out of their mouth and, um, you know, something's not right. So, uh, abnormal upper airway sounds like strider, snoring, crowing, or gurgling. Strider's going to almost be like a, uh, uh, like a whistling sound, uh, like you're blowing air over a bottle. Uh, snoring, obviously, you know what snoring is. Crowing, that's going to, um, be like a, in a cough, um, you know, kind of, kind of sounds just like a crow, and then gurgling, um, gurgling, what it would lead you to believe that there's some kind of, uh, liquid secretions in there, and you probably need to get your suction catheter out and go to work. Um, an awake patient who is unable to speak, uh, if they're awake and they're unable to speak, is there an obstruction, what's going on, uh, that sort of thing, that's going to come within your assessment. Evidence of a foreign body area obstruction, like tongue, vomit, food, blood, or teeth in the upper airway, mouth, or nose. And swelling to the mouth, tongue, or oropharynx, which would be uh, indicative of an allergic reaction. All right, airway assessment of normal upper airway sound, snoring, crowing, gurgling, and strider. Let's, uh, I want to go to the notes here just to see that they give us uh they do so let's look at this all right snoring snoring sounds occurs when the upper airway is partially obstructed by the tongue or by relaxed tissue in the pharynx the snoring and obstruction can be corrected by performing a head tilt chin lift maneuver in a patient with a suspected spinal injury a jaw thrust maneuver must be used crowing is a sound like a crow cawing that occurs when the muscles around the larynx spasm and narrow the opening into the trachea Air rushing through the restricted passage causes the sound. Gurgling, a sound like gargling, usually indicates the presence of blood, vomitous secretions, or other liquid in the airway, immediately suction the substance from the airway. Strider is a harsh, high-pitched sound heard during inspiration. It is characterized uh, of a significant upper airway obstruction from swelling in the larynx. Strider may, be also, heard, may also be heard if a mechanical obstruction by food or other object is present. So there you go. There is your four different sounds that you will hear. Uh, also wheezing. Um, just going to give you, add one to it, wheezing for whenever they're having a severe allergic reaction. Okay, opening the mouth. Mouth. You must open the mouth of an unresponsive patient to assess the airway. It's not going to do you any good unless you open the mouth. You know, you may say, well, there's, there's air moving in, in and out of the nose, but... What if there's an air, uh, something that could possibly be causing um, an obstruction later on, like uh, vomit or something like that, and the patient takes a breath in and, um, you know, then he, then he lodges it in his airway. So you need to make sure you open that mouth. Uh, use the cross finger technique to open the mouth, um, and I'll show you that in skills. Uh, clear the airway of liquids or foreign bodies. When we, and wait, the way we do that is suction with a rigid catheter, and that's we suction on the way out for no more than 10 to 15 seconds. Um, so manual maneuvers for moving, uh, opening the airway could be a head tilt chin lift, um, and it could be a jaw thrust. Those are your manual maneuvers. Suctioning, uh, a rigid catheter, the way you're going to suction, um, and you need to know this for your skills, is I'm going to take a rigid catheter and I'm going to suction the airway no longer than 10, 10 to 15 seconds on the way out. So I'm not going to suction going in. I'm going to suction on the way out. Uh, mechanical airway is going to be your um, NPAs, OPAs, um, king tubes, and, and things like that. Okay. Head tilt chin lift maneuver. Uh, used when no spinal injury is suspected. Used in unresponsive patients. Cardiac arrest. Must be supplemented with a mechanical airway if ineffective on its own. And there is the head tilt chin lift. So those of you who are uh, CPR certified, you know what the head tilt chin lift is. Um, it is taught in your CPR class. We're not going to spend too much time on this. Um, in an infant and children, a head tilt chin lift, you want to avoid overextension of the neck uh, because their trachea is very pliable and it could collapse and get stuck together. And then no matter if you pull the head back forward or not, it's not going to work. It may be necessary to pad beneath the shoulders because the child's head is big, 
So you're going to take some towels or, or t-shirts or whatever and put it underneath their shoulder blades, lifts up their back, and their head will naturally fall back and the airway will open naturally. And there you go. In an infant, be sure to avoid overextension. And um, I'm going to tell you that padding like this is not a good thing. You want to move those towels underneath these shoulder blades right here okay i'm sorry that i have to correct these powerpoints sometimes but i'm telling you right now that's picking the head up towards the chest and it's not doing any good the jaw thrust maneuvers used when spinal injury is suspected allows the neck to remain in a neutral inline position that way we're not manipulating the neck up and down left or right we want to keep it in a neutral inline position that means the nose in line with the sternum and the belly button uh, so that we don't further injure the neck. And here we go. The jaw thrust maneuvers used to open an airway in patients with suspected spinal injury. We are going to get behind the patient just like you see here. And we're going to uh, take that our, our first four fingers and we're going to grab the edge, the corner of that mandible. And we're going to push up the head and neck are kept in a position in, in one position. Uh, you can take those thumbs, you can put them right there. I don't know why you would want to push against yourself, but you can also put them on the uh, cheekbones and you can uh, use that to push up like a, I show you in your skills training. Uh, in infants and children, you follow the basic procedures just to subscribe uh, for adults. Uh, it's, it's no different, just a, a smaller head. There you go. Poor baby. The recovery position. Positioning the patient for airway control. The recovery position is used if a patient has an altered mental status and is at risk of aspiration. That means they vomit and choke on their vomit. We don't want that to happen. So we will lay them on their recovery position. That's either the left or right side. Usually the left side is, is um, what people go for. Um, it is contraindicated in suspected spinal injury and, and patients who need positive pressure ventilation. So contraindicated means it is a no-no. It will hurt the patient. Anytime you hear me say contraindicated, that means it is not good for your patient. So do not do it. Okay, contraindicated. So laying someone in a recovery position with someone with a spinal injury or someone who needs to be have positive pressure ventilation is contraindicated. All right, this person obviously does not have a uh, suspected spinal injury, so they have her on her left side using her arm as a pillow to support the head. Suctioning. Gurgling indicates liquid in the airway. Some suction equipment is not effective in removing thick, vomitous, or solid objects such as teeth, foreign bodies, or food from the airway. So that means you're going to have to take them out with your fingers with a gloved hand. Remember, body substance isolation. Uh, standard precautions during suctioning. You want to wear protective eyewear because things go splitter splatter all over the place and you don't want it in, on your face or in your eye. A mask is good as well so you don't get it in your nose or your mouth. Gloves, obviously, and if you suspect your patient has a uh, communicable disease, an infectious disease, then you want to wear an N95 or HEPA respiratory. Um, HEPA respirator, especially if uh, they're suspected for tuberculosis. Right now, we're going through the coronavirus, and you, uh, anybody suspected of having the coronavirus will have to wear an N95 respirator. Suctioning, suction equipment, it may be mounted in the ambulance or portable. Must generate enough vacuum and airflow to clear the airway. It must have a wide bore, thick tubing, and a collection bottle and water supply. Um, most of your suction devices now have batteries. They are mounted in the uh, ambulance, um, and you can uh, you can leave them there as a mounted unit, and you can also uh, push a button, and they come right out. And you can take them with you. And that is a an onboard suction unit. See the you see all this right here is what's going to cause your suction and this is where you're going to collect everything this cannot come out of the ambulance with you okay that is a portable suction a lot of ambulance companies now are mounting these in 
the uh, the truck as an onboard and portable so that you don't have to worry about two different devices. Most of your hospitals are going to have something like this, okay? Maybe your critical care ambulances and things like that, but uh, most of them have these, so these are really good. So I will tell you that uh, when you when you start your shift, you want to check and make sure your suction is good so that whenever you do, uh, this is a rigid catheter, by the way, so whenever you do uh, go to suction your patient, you can actually it can actually be sucked out of their mouth. So you take you turn the little device on right here, boom, and it goes, brrr, you know, it makes this little suction noise. You take this little hose, and you just grab it right there and pinch it closed, and you'll you'll hear it go brrr, really really loud. And uh, this little gauge will shoot way over here like that, and that means you have good pressure. If it doesn't do that, then uh, you know, you might want to check your device, okay? Uh, here's a manual or hand-powered uh, suction device. This is uh, this little yellow grip over here. You have to squeeze it like you're doing one of those um, forearm exercise things as you uh, got your catheter here and attached here. and You very have a very limited uh, collection, <laughs> uh, so you might not be able to do too much suctioning with that. But... Um, a rigid catheter for suctioning the mouth and the oropharynx is what you're going to use. A soft catheter can be used to suction the nose or the nasopharynx. Also, there are soft catheters that you can slip down um, endotracheal tubes and uh, king tubes because if there's any kind of um, uh, mess that comes up through the esophagus, then you want to slide that down there and, uh, and suction that out so that there's no issues with the tube placement. Suctioning technique, you're going to assemble and turn on the suction unit, measure and insert the catheter. Suction on the way out only. If possible, do not suction for more than 15 seconds at a time. Five seconds in infants and children. And then you're going to rinse the catheter. Um, I don't know where you're going to rinse the catheter. I mean, obviously, once we use equipment on patients, we're going to discard it and throw it away in a biohazard bag. Okay, here's suctioning technique skills. We will uh, go over this in class. Turn on the suction uh, and then make sure it's assembled. Measure the catheter. Corner the mouth to the earlobe, just like you're going to measure an OPA. Open the patient's mouth. You see he's doing that cross finger technique. And insert the catheter. Apply suction as you withdraw the catheter. The way you apply suction, you see his little, his little thumb is over the hole right here, so it's stopping the suction. And then he's on his way out. He lifts his thumb up. And that suction begins. All right. Special considerations when suctioning a patient. If there's too much to suction quickly, roll the patient onto his side and manually sweep the mouth. So if your catheter is too small and you can't get all that uh, big chunks of vomit or teeth or anything like that, you need to roll the patient if they're not um, suspected of a spinal injury and you'd sweep the mouth with your fingers. Uh, alternate 15 seconds of uh, suction with two minutes of ventilation for copious, frothy secretions. Copious means a lot. If you ever hear me say copious, that means a lot. All right, back to your case study. Before moving the patient to a supine position, Chris quickly grabs the portable suction unit and uses a rigid suction catheter to clear the patient's mouth. The EMTs log roll the patient, and Chris uses a head tilt chin lift. To open the airway, the patient's respiratory rate is 6 per minute, and his tidal volume is very shallow. As Chris prepares to provide positive pressure ventilation, what airway adjunct should he consider to assist in keeping the patient's airway open? And what are the advantages and disadvantages of that choice? So, Remember, you need to pause and write these questions down so that you can go back and answer them in the future as we go along. Okay, airway adjuncts. They're used in conjunction with manual airway maneuvers. So if we have to do a jaw thrust or head tilt chin lift and we can't necessarily sit there and hold it, you know, because we're just taking up, a, uh, you're wasting a body while you're, you're holding that in place and that person can't do anything else to help. So we have airway adjuncts. So we, we, uh, put, we can put an OPA in or an MPA in and then we can leave that airway in place and we don't have to sit there and hold a jaw thrust or a head tilt chin lift and we can go to work. OPA, uh, OPAs are used in patients who are unresponsive without a gag reflex. That means 
if you stick it in there and, uh, you know, they begin to gag, then you need to remove it, obviously. Uh, the device must be sized properly, like we showed you the other day. Uh, and they're going to show you here in just a second. That you need to go from the corner of the mouth to the earlobe. All right, there we go. Measuring that OPA. It looks like uh, Queen Elizabeth. Excuse me, my dog heard some noise, so she is barking. And they do the cross finger technique, and they're going to they're going to insert the tip pointing to the roof of the mouth. Advance while rotating 180 degrees. I taught you to put your tip in facing and the corner of the mouth, and you can rotate 90 degrees. It's going to end up the same. The flange rests on the teeth. And I'll tell you what, this lady right here, I know she ain't dead, but she's pretty cool for taking that OPA, man. That's uh, that's crazy. All right. So here we go. It's so with an OPA, uh, when it's properly placed, the airflow goes in, keeps that tongue out of the way, keeps that airway open. Uh, preferred method for inserting an oropharyngeal airway in an infant or child. Um, they using a tongue depressor, and they insert it in. An MPA uh, is useful in patients with clenched teeth, some facial injuries, and those unable to tolerate an oropharyngeal airway. Uh, this should not be used in a patient with suspected fracture of the base of the skull or severe facial trauma. And there you go. There's nasal airways. Ours look different in class. There we go, from the nostril to the earlobe. That is a big fat NPA. I wouldn't want that going in my nose. Lube um, the tip with the water soluble, soluble lubric lubricant. Um, this lubricant is going to come with your NPAs, so you're not going to have to like search for it. When you open it, it should have some in there. Insert with the bevel towards the septum or base of the tonsils. Remember, the septum is what separates the two nostrils. And we insert it down. If we do it on the left side, we just turn this. Uh, so this is the right side. This is what, where we always want to try. It's the right side. We can't get it in on the right. For whatever reason, then we'll go to the left nostril. But we'll turn it upside down and we'll rotate it 180 degrees. All right. Case study conclusion. Chris selects and inserts an OPA and begins positive pressure ventilation. The patient vomits again and Chris immediately stops ventilating as Brittany helps him turn the patient on his left side. Chris removes the oropharyngeal airway and suctions the patient's mouth. As Chris begins ventilations again, a second crew arrives to assist with packaging and transport. Chris continues airway management en route to the emergency department. Soon after arriving, Chris's suspicion that the patient suffered a heroin overdose is confirmed when the emergency department staff administers naloxone, or Narcan, a drug to counteract the effects of narcotics. Within minutes, the patient is awake and talking. All right, the assessment of breathing. After establishing a patent airway, assessing the adequacy of the patient's breathing. Inadequate breathing leads to poor gas exchange in the alveoli and inadequate oxygenation. Focus on both rate of breathing and volume of each breath. The relationship of volume and rate in breathing assessment. The relationship between the volume of air breathed in, the respiratory rate, and the volume of air that reaches the alveoli is critical in determining if the patient is breathing adequately. Tidal volume and minute volume. Tidal volume is the amount of air moved in in one respiration. Uh, minute volume is a function of both respiratory rate and tidal volume. How many breaths they take in a minute. A change in either respiratory rate or tidal volume affects minute volume. Alveolar ventilation is the amount of air breathed in that reaches the alveoli. Dead air space does not change when tidal volume decreases. So if we're breathing in 500 milliliters of air, 
and 150 of those milliliters go to dead airspace. We only have 350 milliliters reaching the alveoli. This does not change if less air is breathed in. So if we breathe in 350 milliliters of air, which is too little, uh, and we lose 150, then only 200 milliliters is reaching the alveoli. So we still have that dead space in there. Rapid respirations can decrease the tidal volume. Assess the rate, rhythm, quality, and depth of breathing. And we will cover more of this whenever we go over it in, uh, in our skills training, in our assessments. Look, listen, feel, and oscillate. Oscillate means we're going to take our little stethoscope, we're going to put it on our patient's chest and back, and we're going to listen to air move in and out. And there's some areas that we need to oscillate. And this is the anterior and lateral chest. You can just mirror mirror these uh, right here on the posterior chest. Adequate breathing. Assess the following. Rate, rhythm, quality, and depth. Breathing can be adequate, but if the patient is working hard to breathe, harder to breathe, he is in respiratory distress. Signs of adequate breathing. There is a normal respiratory rate. Um, you need to go back and, and look at uh, the respiratory rates for um, children, infants and children and adults in lifespan development. Uh, there's clear and equal breath sounds bilaterally. Bilaterally means both sides, both lungs. Adequate air movement heard and felt from nose and mouth. That means um, we need to, uh, that gives us a, an indication that they have uh, the, the correct amount of tidal volume. Good chest rise and fall with each ventilation. Inadequate breathing. Inadequate breathing leads to hypoxia, low oxygen, low oxygen. If breathing is inadequate, the brain begins to die within four to six minutes. Inadequate breathing can either can be either respiratory failure or respiratory arrest. Patients with respiratory failure or arrest require immediate positive pressure ventilation. Uh, signs of inadequate breathing or rate is tachypnea. Tachypnea means uh, fast breathing, or bradypnea means slow breathing. The rhythm is in an irregular pattern. Um, quality is breath sounds that are decreased or absent. The depth, the depth of breathing, tidal volume is shallow and inadequate. Uh, any above sign is a reason to artificially ventilate the patient. That means you're going to take your bag valve mask, or your 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 bag valve mask, your bag and your mask, and you're going to put it on your patient's face and you're going to breathe for them. Um, abnormal work of breathing, you see retractions, nasal flaring, abdominal breathing, and diaphoreses. Abnormal breath sounds, strider, wheezing, crackles, silent chest, which is no breath sounds heard, and unequal breath sounds. A reduced minute volume it means we're going to have a decreased tidal volume and inadequate respiratory rate. Inadequate, che inadequate chest wall movement or chest wall injury. Your paradoxal chest wall movement. The chest wall segment moves during inspiration and out during expiration, which is the reverse of normal. Splinting of the chest wall. So we don't want to splint too tightly. Asymmetrical chest wall movement. That means it's not moving the way it should be moving when it, when it rises and falls. And if you don't know what that looks like, then look down at your chest and breathe in and out. Irregular respiratory pattern uh, can be from a head injury, stroke, metabolic derangement, and toxic inhalation. Rapid respiratory rate without clinical improvement in the patient's condition. All right. We're looking at this patient right here. We see fast or slow respiratory rate. 
nasal flaring, unequal or inadequate chest expansion, sternocleidomastoid muscle use, right here, cool and clammy skin, occasional gasping breaths may be seen just before respiratory or cardiac arrest, and irregular rhythm. So this would be a regular rhythm. This would be an irregular rhythm. An increased effort to breathe. You can you can see the look on their face and look at their chest, and you can obviously tell that they are working harder to breathe. Shallow or inadequate depth of breathing. Succumoral and intra intraoral cyanosis around the mouth and inside on the lips. Intercostal, supraclavicular, and super, suprasternal retractions. So intercostal, meaning these muscles here. Supraclavicular, meaning these muscles up here. Suprasternal, all these muscles here. Retractions, you see them flexing up. Okay, deciding whether or not to assist ventilation. The EMT must decide whether the patient needs to be ventilated or if oxygen alone is sufficient. Neither rate or depth alone is enough to ensure adequate breathing. Okay, you can look at this table. When you make a decision, should I assist ventilation or apply oxygen? Look at here, you see uh, assessment, conclusion, and emergency care. There's three. So the assessment, adequate respiratory rate plus adequate tidal volume. Conclusion is adequate breathing. Emergency care, administer oxygen if necessary. And so forth. You look at your assessment, your conclusion, and in your emergency care. The difference between, uh, or so we're going to talk about the techniques of artificial ventilation. Differences between normal spontaneous ventilation and positive pressure ventilation. There are significant physiological differences between spontaneous breathing and positive pressure ventilation. Uh, air movement, air wall pressure, esophageal open pr opening pressure, and cardiac output. Basic considerations. You must be able to maintain a good mask seal. The device must deliver an adequate volume of air to inflate the lungs. There must be a connection to allow oxygen delivery while artificially uh, breathing. So you, you can connect an oxygen tubing to your bag valve mask to deliver 100% oxygen. And I will tell you that, that actually uh, ventilating a patient, uh, you would think during CPR, oh, it's just a mannequin and, and it's not going to be the same. It's, it's almost the same. Making that seal, squeezing that bag and watching that chest rise and fall is almost the same as actually doing it on a patient. Your basic considerations, you want to take your standard precautions, your gloves, eyewear, face mask for large amounts of blood or secretions, your HEPA or N95 respirator for suspected tuberculosis or infectious diseases. Adequate ventilation indications. Uh, there's a sufficient rate or delivery, uh, deliver ventilations over one second. Sufficient and consistent tidal volume. The patient's heart rate returns to normal and their color improves. Inadequate ventilation. Ventilation rate is too fast or too slow. The chest does not rise and fall. The heart rate does not return to normal and the color does not improve. Cricoid pressure, burp, and ELM. Cricoid pressure is not recommended for routine use but can be used in some situations like adult intubation and pediatric patient with an extra EMT is available. Then we have the burp and the ELM. So other basic ventilation considerations, um, when forced backward, the cricoid cartilage may collapse the esophagus, preventing air from inflating the stomach. If the patient regurgitates, release the cricoid, uh, cricoid burp or ELM pressure. Proper positioning of the airway with the head tilt chin lift maneuver will reduce airway resistance. There is cricoid pressure. You're pushing down on that cricoid cartilage, which is right below the thyroid cartilage.
I'm going to skip right over mouth to mouth and mouth to nose technique because we do not recommend it anymore. We are not going to teach it in here. I do not recommend you use it unless it is a family member that you know and love and trust that they are not carrying an infectious disease. Mouth to mask or bag valve ventilation. Um, mouth to mask, you can use a, a barrier filter. I'm okay with that if you don't have a bag and then also obviously have the bag. Um, ventilation volumes and duration of ventilation. Adjust the rate and volume based on the patient's age, whether the patient has a pulse, advanced airway in place, and avoid over, in over ventilation. Okay, gastric inflation. It's going to be a gross thing for you. It leads to regurgitation and aspiration and impaired ventilation. We don't want our patient to aspirate, and we definitely don't want them to regurgitate because it's going to regurgitate right up on us. Uh, we, we need to, in, well, the way we find out if there's gastric inflation is we take our little stethoscope and find the stomach in whatever quadrant it's in, which you should know that, and we listen whenever somebody breathes in or have somebody listen for you. And if they hear um, air going into the stomach, then they can tell you, then you can reduce the tidal volume delivered and use supplemental oxygen to maintain oxygenation with the smaller tidal volume. Some advantages, a single EMT can maintain a good seal, mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation. Um, this is also for your BVM as well. It eliminates direct contact with the patient. It has a one-way valve, meaning air goes in one way and nothing comes out that way. Uh, that's important because you don't want the patient breathing uh, carbon dioxide on you or regurgitating on you. It provides adequate tidal volume and supplemental oxygen can be administered. And there's a pocket mask with a one-way valve and ventilation port. Disadvantages to this, the mask is perceived by some EMTs as having an increased risk of infection. The EMT providing ventilation may fatigue because uh, you are breathing your own air. Uh, doesn't allow for the highest possible concentration of oxygen to be delivered because we breathe out carbon dioxide. And there are required characteristics. We are going to um, kind of go through this kind of quick. We're going to connect the mask to the oxygen, position yourself at the patient's head, use the CE technique to seal the mask and perform a head tilt chin lift. The CE technique uh, was taught to you in your CPR class, but we will go over it in skills again. Below into the ventilation port. There you go. See her uh, thumb and forefinger are in a C formation, and these are these other three fingers are in an E formation. For suspected spinal injury, modify the technique for suspected spinal injury. If the person is pulseless and cannot be ventilated, it may be necessary to reposition the head. Uh, the airway is your priority. Ineffective ventilation. Recognize and correct ineffective ventilation. If the ventilations are ineffective, it is necessary to immediately identify and correct the problem. Again, you should have learned this in your CPR class. Okay, the bag valve mask ventilation. Select the appropriate size and use only enough volume to cause the chest to rise. Too much air going in could go down into the esophagus, into the stomach, and we have gastric inflation. Two-person technique is preferred. It can deliver close to 100% oxygen because we should be bagging a patient connected to 100% oxygen. It may allow medic medication administration um, if we have to give albuterol or anything like that. It may allow uh, it may allow in tidal CO2 sampling. Uh, we will definitely uh, be talking about that because a lot of uh, EO2, um, excuse me, in tidal CO2 sampling is important, um, and I can tell you why. Uh, we'll go over it more in class when we do skills. Okay, here's some BVMs, the basic structures of BVMs. Um, there's a lot of different kinds. Um, you see the adult, child, infant, and it should allow for you not to squeeze as much air going in. Uh, oxygen reservoir bags on all of them, you're going to fill those up. 
uh, before you use them. Uh, the oxygen tubing connects to the back. Here's your back ventilation bag. Your non-rebreathing valve, that means it's a one-way. An exhalation port here. And then the face mask. And that's how we should position the mask on the, on the patient. The very tip goes on the bridge of the nose. The bottom of the mask goes right below the bottom lip. All right, for no suspected spinal injury, we want to use a head tilt chin lift. Um, suspect, uh, excuse me, select the correct size mask and bag valve device. Position the mask and use an EC technique. A second EMT squeezes the bag. Um, I'm going to tell you right now that most of the time you're going to have just going to be you and your partner. So it's going to be you having to do the head tilt chin lift, make a mask seal, and squeeze the bag. So you need to practice that. You need to get it good. You need to get good at it. That's if all the planets are aligned and the moon's shining bright. You got two people. That'd be great. Okay. Uh, suspected spinal injury um, for BVM. Modified technique for suspected spinal injury. Recognize and correct ineffective ventilations. Okay. Inline stabilization during a BVM ventilation. He is using his legs or his knees to stabilize that head from going back and forth and up and down. You can also have another partner if you so choose or if you so have the availability for it. Um, that would be wonderful. That would be wonderful. But it's not always the case. So unfortunately, people are not jumping off cliffs trying to get into this profession. So, All right. Flow restricted oxygen powered ventilation device. Uh, a manually triggered ventilation device delivers 100% ventilation. Can be used by one EMT using a two handed technique to seal the mask. Only for adult patients. The techniques for using this device are check the unit and oxygen source, open the airway and establish a seal with the mask, depress the trigger, uh, release it as the chest begins to rise. And there you go. There's the trigger where his thumb is. He depresses the trigger, delivers the breaths. You see the, the chest rise. You let go of the trigger. Automatic transport ventilator. Some advantages are they can deliver a consistent rate and tidal volume. Uh, delivers 100% oxygen and lower risk of gastric distension. Um, automatic transport ventilator recommended features are simple and time uh, or volume cycle. Um, this 15 over 12 millimeter connector, lightweight and rugged in design, uh, 60 centimeters H2O, H2O inspiratory pressure limit, adjustable from 20 to 80 centimeters of, ox, of uh, H2O, can deliver 50 to 100 percent H2O and one second inspiratory time. And that's what it looks like. And I'm going to tell you right now, unless you are trained critical care, you will not use one of these. This is just for your information. I guarantee you this will not be on the test. Okay, techniques for the ATV. Check the device, seal the mass of the face. Select the tidal volume and rate. Observe for adequate chest rise and fall and recognize and correct ineffective ventilations. Ventilate, ventilation of a patient who is breathing spontaneously. Recognize the need to ventilate. Realize complications. Explain the procedure to the patient. Ventilate to achieve the normal rate and or tidal volume. All right, CPAP. You will probably use CPAP in your career. It is a form of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. CPAP, Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. It's used in awake, spontaneously breathing patients who need ventilatory support. And that device on her face is exactly what a CPAP device looks like. I have one in class and I will show you. Remember, your patient must be awake and spontaneously breathing to use CPAP. CPAP on a child. Okay, how CPAP improves ventilation and oxygenation. CPAP can help avoid the need for endotracheal intubation in some patients. 
Oxygen should be titrated to the patient's SpO2 reading and signs and symptoms. So we don't want to have the oxygen go too high because too much oxygen can be bad and lead to cell death. But we want to make sure we have enough oxygen flowing so that our patient gets what, what they need. Uh, positive pressure is measured in centimeters of H2O. Positive pressure helps inflate collapsed alveoli and improve oxygenation. It will also, that continuous positive air pressure will also push fluid out of the lungs as well. It will decrease the work of breathing and it helps displace fluid in alveoli and left ventricular, ventricular failure. Delivered at 2 to 20 centimeters of H2O, but most orders do not exceed 10. It begins at the lowest setting and you titrate up to what you need. Always, anytime you use oxygen, you always want to start at the lowest you can. Um, and then you might want to increase as you go until you get to where you need to be. Many EMS protocols restrict CPAP to patients over the age of 12. You need to follow your local protocols for whatever company you go to work for. Criteria and indications for CPAP. They must be awake and, and can obey your commands. They, can ma they have to maintain uh, their airway. They can uh, uh, breathe, be breathing with a, a respiratory rate of greater than 25 per minute, which is really fast for an adult. Uh, moderate to severe respiratory distress or early respiratory failure. Indications include, excuse me, go back. Indications include congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema, COPD, asthma, pneumonia. CPAP should be used with caution in patients with hypotension and hypovolemia because it can lower your blood pressure. CPAP creates an increase in intrathoracic pressure that may result in a decrease in cardiac output, worsening the state of hypotension or hypoperfusion. Administration procedure, inform and coach the patient, minimize the patient's anxiety, have, um, obtain vital signs in SpO2, have an adequate oxygen supply, place the patient in seated or semi-fowler's position. Assemble and check the device, secure the mask with straps, increase pressure in increments of 2 centimeters of H2O, and continue to coach the patient. Assessing the patient's response to CPAP, you want to assess the respiratory and heart rate, the systolic blood pressure, oxygen saturation, end tidal CO2, and any complaint of dyspnea, which means they're having trouble breathing. Okay, as we assess the patient's response to CPAP, we need to monitor for, monitor for a pneumothorax because unfortunately, Continuous positive airway pressure could rupture the lung. Gastric distension, vomiting, increased respiratory distress or failure, decreased mental status, and intolerance of the device. BiPAP is bilevel, bilevel or biphasic positive airway pressure. It is like CPAP, but it allows you to set different airway pressures for inspiration and expiration. Hazards of overventilating. Over, in, um, yeah, overventilation. Overinflation leads to serious complications. In cardiac arrest, perfusion is decreased. In spontaneously breathing patients, return to left ventri uh, ventricle can be reduced. Return to the left ventricle means the return of blood to the left ventricle. Special considerations in airway management and ventilation. A patient with a stoma or tracheostomy tube. A stoma may indicate a tracheostomy, which may be temporary. A tracheostomy tube may be placed in the stoma. A stoma also may indicate a partial or turtle, total laryngectomy. Laryngectomy means the, lar the larynx has been removed. And there you go. There is the stoma. So it's kind of, it's kind of, I think it's kind of bad. They call them the neck breathers. The neck breathers airway has been changed by surgery. And on the left, you see the laryngectomy. The larynx has been removed. There's a stoma. The tube is in place. The air moves in and out here. Over here, uh, you have a uh, partial laryngectomy where just part of it's been removed. Same thing, stoma, tube in place. 
but they can also breathe in and out of their nose as well. BVM to a tracheostomy tube ventilation. The bag valve device can connect to a tracheostomy tube. If there's not a tracheostomy tube, place a mask over the stoma to provide bag valve ventilations. There you go. This little device right here with this little line hooked to it, right there, there's the tube, there's the BVM, but this little device right here is called an end an entitled CO2 device. All right, it may be necessary to suction the stoma and it may be necessary to seal the mouth and nose because you don't want air going and escaping up through the oro and nasopharynx. Uh, again, mouth to stoma uh, ventilation is going to be like mouth to mouth. I'm, I'm not going to tell you to do this. I'm going to skip right over this. Please do not put your mouth on someone's stoma. Okay? Unless you, they're family and you know them and you trust them. All right, infants and children, um, special considerations and airway management, place the head in a neutral position, avoid excessive uh, volumes and pressures, use a BVM with four, 450 to 500 milliliters of volume and without a pop-off valve. Use an OPA um, or a nasal pharyngeal airway if required. Ventilate at 12 to 20 times per minute or once every three to five seconds. Patients with facial injuries. Swelling can include the airway. Use an airway adjunct if needed. Avoid a nasopharyngeal airway if the patients uh, with mid in patients with mid face uh, trauma. Bleeding may require frequent suctioning. Form foreign body airway obstruction if the patient is effectively moving air. Instruct him to cough and administer oxygen. If air exchange is poor, manage as for a complete airway obstruction. For a child or adult, perform abdominal thrust. For an infant, perform chest thrust and back blows, just like you learned in your CPR class. Dental appliances, manage in place when the dentures are secure. If the dentures are loose, remove them. All right, oxygen therapy. 100% oxygen is stored in cylinders. Oxygen cylinders, uh, each uh, cylinder volume varies. Pressure in a full cylinder is 2,000 PSI. 2,000 PSI. The duration and flow. The only way to truly determine the amount of oxygen in the tank is to apply the gauge and identify the PSI of pressure remaining in the tank. Formula to calculate oxygen tank duration. The tank pressure measured by the gauge and PSI minus the safe residual pressure that is always set at 200 PSI times the constant divided by the flow rate expected to be delivered or being delivered to the patient in liters per minute. This will provide you with how long the oxygen will last at a desired flow rate for the specific tank. If we look down at the cylinder constant, um, we, we, you, can, you can look at this, you can learn this equation. Uh, we will not have this on the test, okay? Um, as an example, to determine how long the full 2000 PSI E cylinder will last with the patient on an honor breather mask at 15 liters, you would calculate the following. There's your equation and there's your answer, 33.6 minutes. The oxygen tank will provide oxygen at 15 liters to the patient for a period of 33.6 minutes. I'm just going to be real with you for a second. You ain't got time to do this equation on the truck. This is if you're sitting there and you're waiting for a bed or something like that, and you got your patient on oxygen, and you're concerned about your oxygen tank running out, and you got time to do this math. I'm just telling you that right now. You need to check your tanks before you leave the station and know how much oxygen you have in all of them. That way, when you put them on your patient, you're like, hey, look, I got enough oxygen to get this patient from the scene, then to the hospital, and when they get to the hospital, then they can put them on continuous oxygen. And then you look at your gauge again on your regulator and you say, okay, well, this is how much oxygen I have left. Do I need to go back to the station and switch out tanks? I'm not trying to discount this equation. I'm just telling you, you don't have time to do it. Okay, safety precautions. No combustible materials contacting the cylinder components because oxygen is flammable. No smoking near the oxygen cylinder. Please do not, I hope you're not smoking while you're at work anyway. Store cylinders in 125 degrees Fahrenheit, below 125 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Use with a proper, properly fitting regulator. Keep all valves closed when not in use because you obviously don't want oxygen leaking out. Uh, keep the cylinder secured. That way they're not bouncing around because if that top breaks off, it's going to turn into a missile. Do not place your body over the valve because if it breaks off, it will shoot through your body like a bullet. Pressure regulators. Reduce the pressure in the cylinder to a safe range and control the flow of oxygen. A therapy regulator delivers oxygen from 0.5 to 25 liters per minute. Oxygen humidifiers. Oxygen leaving the cylinder is dry, which can be irritating to the respiratory tract. An oxygen humidifier can add moisture to the oxygen, generally used for long-term therapy. And there's an oxygen humidifier. Because I will tell you that your, your, uh, your lower airway has a certain amount of moisture in it at all times. Otherwise, it would be very irritating to us. The clinical decision making regarding oxygen administration. Too much oxygen can worsen conditions such as ischemic stroke and acute coronary syndrome. Such patients should only receive oxygen if they have evidence of hypoxia or dyspnea or an SpO2 at less than 94%. Begin administration at 2 to 4 liters by nasal cannula. Always follow protocols. Administer supplemental oxygen if any of the following are present, an SpO2 of less than 94%, dyspnea or respiratory distress, signs of poor perfusion, and signs of heart failure. Indications for oxygen administration, cardiac or respiratory arrest, any patient receiving positive pressure ventilation, signs of hypoxia and adequate respirations, and SpO2 of less than 94%. Any medical condition that may cause hypoxia, an SpO2 reading of less than 94, or the oxygen saturation level is unknown. Dyspnea or respiratory distress. Signs of poor perfusion. Signs of heart failure. Suspected shock. All right, variations in SpO2, goals for medical, trauma, and other special consideration results. Medical condition, trauma condition, pregnant patient greater than 20 weeks gestation, inhaled poisons or toxic exposure, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Hazards of oxygen administration. Oxygen toxicity is rare but can happen over long periods of time. Damage to the retina can occur in premature newborns with excessive oxygen administration. Respiratory depre uh, depression may occur in some COPD patients. Click on the condition that is not an indication for the administration of supplemental oxygen. If you chose acute coronary syndrome with an SpO2 of 95%, you would be correct. Not all patients require supplemental oxygen therapy. In fact, high oxygen concentrations can be harmful in some conditions, including acute coronary syndrome and ischemic stroke in patients with no indications of hypoxia or respiratory distress. Oxygen administration procedures. Ensure the cylinder contains oxygen. Uh, I shouldn't have to say that, but obviously people have tried to administer oxygen and, and no, no oxygen in the tank. Open and shut the valve for one second. Place the yoke of the regulator over the valve and tighten. Apply the valve half turn to check pressure. Attach tubing to the regulator, set the flow rate, and apply the device to the patient. And they're going to show you this real quick. There's some, some of your oxygen uh, tanks come with a, uh, a barrier device here. Take it off. That protective seal, excuse me. Uh, crack the seal for one second just to blow off any dust and debris that's going to be located in here where the oxygen is coming out. Attach your regulator. Align the pins, and over here you're going to screw it down, tighten it down, and this will be your gauge right here. You want 2,000 psi. Screw the regulator down. Turn it on. Turn on the uh, tank up here, and then you should see the oxygen gauge jump up to 2,000 psi if it is full. Attach the tubing to the regulator here. Turn it on. 
to the uh, desired amount and fill your reservoir back if you're using a um, non-rebreather and apply the mass to the patient. Okay, terminating oxygen therapy. When terminating oxygen, oxygen therapy, first remove the mass from the patient before turning off the oxygen or disconnect any oxygen tubing. Transferring the oxygen source uh, portable to onboard. When transferring from one oxygen source to another, first remove the mask from the patient before turning off the oxygen or disconnecting the oxygen tubing. All right, a non-rebreather mask is used to deliver high concentrations of oxygen. The flow rate is usually 15 liters per minute. I will tell you to use a non-rebreather at 8 to 15 liters per minute. Always keep the reservoir bag full and inflated, just like that. Don't forget this little thing here, kind of contours the mask to the patient's nose, keeping it in place. All right, so you see the oxygen comes in 100% down the, the reservoir bag, 100% oxygen flows up through the mask, goes into the mouth and the nose. Uh, ambient air is sealed out, and the delivered concentration is approximately 90% oxygen. And we normally breathe in 21% in ambient air. Nasal cannula is used to deliver a lower concentration of oxygen. I will tell you from 2 to 6 liters in class. And there it is. It, 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 the little things go in the nose. It's a little uncomfortable. Then it goes around the ear, behind the ear, then back around the neck. And always remember to tighten it up because, uh, and not to choke your patient, but, but if you don't tighten it up, then uh, it will fall off. The patient still breathes in ambient air, but also 100% oxygen through the nasopharynx. So 24 to 44% oxygen concentration is delivered. Uh, other oxygen delivery devices, simple face mask, partial rebreathers, tracheostomy mask, and venturi mask. There's your simple face mask, no, um, no reservoir bag. Partial non-rebreather, Venturi mask, okay. EMTs, uh, Carlos Rivera and Alan Abrams are caring for Ms. Uh, Alina Diaz, who is 63 years old. Ms. Diaz, had, Ms. Diaz has COPD and presents today with shortness of breath. She can speak only a few words at a time before gasping for breath. How will the EMTs determine the severity of the patient's difficulty breathing? What will they be looking for? How will the patient, how will the EMT, excuse me, decide what interventions the patient requires? Pause this video and write these questions down. Ms. Diaz appears fatigued and drowsy. She has cyanosis of her lips and nail beds, and the EMTs can hear wheezing when she breathes, even without using a stethoscope. Ms. Diaz is breathing about 30 times per minute, but she is not moving very much air with each breath and she is using accessory muscles. Is Ms. Diaz breathing adequately or inadequately? Explain your answer. And what intervention should Ms. Diaz receive? The EMTs quickly decide to assist Ms. Diaz ventilations with the bag valve mass device. Alan explains to her what they are going to do as Carlos prepares the equipment. What should the goals, uh, what should be the goals for the depth and rate of ventilation for Ms. Diaz? What complications should the EMTs anticipate? And how will the EMTs know if the assisted ventilations are effective? Our conclusion is Carlos attaches supplemental oxygen to the bag valve mass device at a flow rate of 15 liters per minute. He assists Ms. Diaz respiration 16 times per minute, assisting uh, every other breath with a tidal volume of approximately 600 milliliters. In route to the hospital, Ms. Diaz's respiratory rate and heart rate decreases and her SpO2 increases from 88 to 94%. The EMTs release Ms. Diaz to the care of the emergency department staff. Following stabilization in the emergency department, Ms. Diaz is admitted to the hospital for treatment of the exacerbation of her COPD. The EMTs write their report, clean the ambulance, and replace the supplies in preparation for the next call. Our lesson summary is without an open airway and adequate ventilation, patients rapidly deteriorate and die. EMTs must quickly recognize and, and, and 
an inadequate airway and breathing and immediately intervene. Oxygen therapy is used to reduce, eliminate, or prevent hypoxia from occurring in the patient. All right, we will see you next time.